All right, Bruce, I am honored to have you on the program. And uh, as I mentioned in our phone call a little bit earlier today, uh, I am personally um, uh, indebted to you in many different ways. I've listened to a lot of your material, and I have uh, gleaned so much uh, from uh, a variety of the subjects that you've posted uh, on YouTube in particular. So to begin, I'd like to thank you for the material that you put on YouTube, because there are people out there that you uh, have no idea that are listening to it and learning and growing. So thank you for that. Well, I appreciate that very much. I've, I've had, uh, to be honest with you, vastly more uh, positive response than I ever imagined when I first started uploading to YouTube. I thought this would be for my mother and sister, and that's about it, you know. So oh, it's been very gratifying. So I appreciate yeah, it. That, yeah, especially knowing what it's turned into now. Those comments are extre extremely humorous. So, um, so now most of my audience in particular is, is going to be clueless to who you are, to be honest. So um, okay. if you don't mind, I'd like to begin with uh, just an introduction of yourself of who uh, Bruce Gore is. Well, um, it's a pretty short, boring story. You know, I uh, live here in Spokane. I grew up in Grand Coulee, Washington, which is about 100 miles from here, Grand Coulee Dam, probably heard of that my dad worked there I went to Whitworth University here in Spokane in 1967 and uh, <clears throat> after I graduated I uh, was uh, involved in teaching for a few years but had a little bit of a doctrinal falling out with the institution I was teaching for and so needing a job I went to law school and became a lawyer and practiced uh, law here in Spokane for uh, a little, around 20 years or so Last uh, 10 years of my working career, I went to work for a classical Christian school here in Spokane. You mentioned uh, the philosophy class. That's where I taught philosophy to high school seniors and a bunch of other classes, Bible and history and apologetics, that kind of thing. Retired about eight years ago. And, uh, you know, probably about the year 2010, I was, I was teaching in my church, Presbyterian Church here in Spokane, and someone said, you know, you ought to uh, you ought to video these uh, lectures you're giving and upload them to YouTube. And I, I thought, you know, <clears throat> never occurred to me to do something like that. But um, right, that little uh, in uh, that little encouragement, I figured out how to do it. And and uh, so since then, that's kind of been uh, one of my most satisfying uh, ways of working is just having mm. these uh, responses, interacting with people through the videos on YouTube. That's great. Well, hey, I appreciate the fact that you appreciate it, that it means something to you as well. I like how you said that you just casually, you needed a job, so you became a lawyer. I wish that like that was for, for the rest of us. And then, um, yeah, I mentioned to you the philosophy course in particular. I've watched many of the courses, um, or the playlists, I should say, but particularly that philosophy course and, and um, uh, my, my oldest daughter and I will joke around about the paradox. I think it's Zeno's uh, a paradox. paradox. Yeah. Yeah. The arrow. So we'll make up our own paradoxes around uh, okay. the house and, and joke about that. So yeah, I, I really enjoy that. And I appreciate that. Uh, uh, the, that, uh, somebody, uh, who, whoever that was, I don't know who it was, but who, whomever they were that, that pushed you to post everything to YouTube. Um, I appreciate that as well. So, um, uh, so that's the introduction of who Bruce Gore is. And when I reached out to you uh, for uh, through email and doing uh, just a, a podcast and 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 recording and speaking and a, a discussion, um, I mentioned uh, dispensationalism. Now, in the future, yeah. if you were able to come on, I would love to talk eschatology as well. Okay. Um, so uh, I think. I think probably it, it makes logical sense to begin with the the subject of dispensationalism. Okay. Um, the church that I pastor and much of the audience, we would hold to a, uh, a position uh, very similar to yours. I'm not sure what designation you use, but we would we would um, uh, adhere to covenant theology. Mm -hmm. So you're going to be, uh, uh, you know, uh, just speaking to people that are in agreement uh, okay. with you during this, but they really would probably learn some things um, about the history maybe of dispensationalism. Mm -hmm. So if you don't mind, uh, define what dispensationalism is, just in case there's anyone who is unaware what that is, and then uh, yeah, well, just give us uh, the history of it. Sure. The uh, the word dispensational is actually uh, had its roots in the King James Version of the Bible, uh, and it's the translation of a Greek word, oikon oikonomia, uh, which literally means house law. You probably know that. And uh, and so it, it didn't have so much to do with time frames. It had to do with administration. Uh, it was applied to someone who would be something like a steward, uh, 
uh, the chief butler, you might say, in a house who had administrative responsibilities and authority within the house. So that was the, the meaning of the word. However, uh, it was translated by the, the uh, English word dispensation or dispensational, and it's used in the New Testament. Uh, so Paul speaks of dispensation, you know, uses that term. And uh, by the time it had been picked up by certain people who wanted to sort of import a particular theological outlook, it took on the meaning of time frames in history. And so usually when people, if they know anything about it at all, when they hear the word dispensation or dispensations, plural, they think it's referring to time periods in history. Right. And uh, that was really kind of the calling card originally of dispensationalism. Classical right. Christian understanding in all of its major branches, Catholic, Protestant, Eastern, all basically understood that God made a great covenant with Abraham, a covenant of grace that was realized in the seed singular of Abraham, Amen. who is Christ, and that anyone who has faith in Christ becomes derivatively through Christ, seed of Abraham. Well, that, that's old news. Uh, but uh, in the early 1800s, uh, there was kind of an explosion of, of, I would say, of religious movements. Uh, there are a variety of reasons for that. The Second Great Awakening and various mm -hmm. cultural forces that, uh, that generated a bunch of uh, odd kind of theological outlooks. Some, some of the groups that we might call cults. Right. Or, at that uh, Seventh Day Adventists, I don't call them cult, a cult, but nevertheless they got their starting start about that time. Uh, uh, right, with, Mormons, Jehovah's right. Witnesses as well, exactly. though, whom that would apply to. And another group that got started at that time was what came to be called. It wasn't called originally dispensationalism. The individual involved in it was John Nelson Darby. He cobbled together some kind of strands of thought that came down through history from fairly obscure sources, but, but put it together into a fairly systematic idea that God has worked through, the, through history in various dispensations, the dispensation of innocence, of human government, of law, of grace, the kingdom is still coming, and so on, you know, that idea. And, uh, and out of that came a whole kind of intricate theology of what's happening in the world and how we're living at this point, according to Darby and according to most dispensationalists, in the end times. We're li living toward the end of the era of grace and that Christ will return at some point and establish the kingdom, which will be the seventh of these dispensations. So that's kind of the real short sketch of, of its uh, history. Of course, much more to say about it, but... But right, right. Beginnings back in the early 1800s. Yeah, so, um, yeah, right around the time, as you mentioned, of the Second Great Awakening, and then exactly. as a result of that, there was there was a lot of variety of religious movements. So you, you probably like the fact that Charles Finney was a Presbyterian, and he was at the <laughs> forefront of that, because I know that you're a Presbyterian. But um, so— um, one thing in particular that—a point that you made that maybe not a lot of people are aware of is that— you didn't come right out and say it, but essentially uh, you implied or assumed that um, dispensationalism is a modern movement. It's a modern system of interpretation or a modern system of understanding Scripture. Yes, exactly. A modern meaning in the last couple of hundred years. If you date it back to the early 1800s, then we're looking at a couple of hundred years, and that would be modern by right. historic standards. You bet. Yeah, I guess you did say it explicitly because you 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 spoke in the uh, the, the counter of it in uh, namely explaining that all throughout history the classical Christian understanding was that God made a covenant with Abraham and then you right. cited Galatians 3:16, right? Yes. Exactly, with his seed. Yeah. Yes. Um so uh, another thing you did there that's interesting is that it uh it sounded as if uh premillennialism was was uh uh, inextricably linked with dispensationalism. Is that, yes, is that the yes, case? It is, that is true. Uh, there are certainly... Yeah, if you don't mind fleshing that out for a minute, that, that'd sure. be an important point. Yeah. There are certainly premillennialists who are not dispensational. That's important to point out. Uh, but I don't think there's any dispensational uh, Christian who isn't premillennial. That's, that's right. Part, that's a good point. Of the uh, dispensational outlook. Premillennialism actually goes back uh, to the second century, there were, yeah. uh, it may have been the dominant view in the second right. century. Although, uh, you know, if, if anyone sat down and read the uh, 
anti nicene fathers especially second century you find that none of them say much about it it's not like this is a dominant theme uh, yeah. independently it just so happens however that it, it, if people do mention it they tend to have a premillennial outlook i think the reason for that is because the jewish influence in the christian faith was still pretty uh, dominant and the uh, jewish outlook was that jesus or the messiah I should say would establish an earthly political kingdom right and to the degree that second century christianity still had a pretty significant uh, Jewish influence and in that view persisted. So there was an expectation that Jesus had gone into heaven. He was going to come back uh, pretty soon and establish an earthly kingdom. And there was an expectancy that that was going to happen. So you see that that kind of premillennial outlook, but it was not dispensational in this technical sense. It was just a premillennial understanding of eschatology. Yeah, and, and premillennialism today, uh, w coming in most of the time, at least the flavor of dispensationalism, is also going to have a lot of those same same distinctives: yes. a, uh, a, the, a physical coming, uh, uh, the the physical Jerusalem today is where Christ will come and reign right. from. It'll be a very similar interpretation of that, and we yes. see uh, the appeal to a lot of certain particular uh, Old Testament scriptures, which may have been the very same case. Um, in the second century, that would make sense with that. Sure. Um, yeah. So, um, what what would you say are the errors, in your personal opinion, uh, scripturally of dispensationalism? And you alluded to them just in passing there a moment ago. Yeah. Well, I think uh, you know, of course, there's a lot of things that come to mind. But if you're looking for a linchpin, you might say kind of an undergirding principle that I believe. Uh, virtually has to be present for dispensationalism to remain intact. It's the idea that God has two different redemptive programs going on in history, one of which is connected to the church, uh, and the other of which is connected to Israel. And so the idea right. is that Israel, as a distinct ethnicity, really, uh, is uh, part of the um, story of history, and that uh, God has been preserving Israel and, in fact, reconstituted Israel as a state in 1948 uh, precisely because he has redemptive purposes that are connected distinctively to Israel. Israel, through history, Jewish people have largely been unbelieving. There's always been a remnant, as Paul promises, but uh, for the most part, of course, uh, Jewish people have not typically been distinguished for their Christian convictions. But the idea has been that, nevertheless, God has preserved them. And at a certain point, uh, Christ is going to return and reestablish and really uh, fully, uh, you might say, execute the promises that he made in the Old Testament concerning a time of great blessedness, a so-called millennium, a thousand-year reign. And Jesus will be here reigning in person in that time. And so that, you know, that's really the underpinnings. Well, if you look at the New Testament you see that not only does the New Testament not teach that, but in fact, it emphatically repudiates the idea right. that ethnic Jews are uh, to be regarded as the seed of Abraham, that they're to be regarded as the ones to whom the promises to Abraham and his seed are going to be realized. Paul says he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward in the flesh. He says in Romans chapter 9, they are not all Israel simply because they descend right. from Jacob from Israel. He says in Galatians chapter 3, uh, those who are of faith in Christ are the seed of Abraham and right. their promises. Well, you look in vain in the New Testament for anything that really uh, makes the case for a understanding of the seed of Abraham to be ethnic Jewish people. The fact is, in the New Covenant era, there is no Jew, there is no Greek. Uh, we all right. come to Christ on equal footing. We all come by faith in Christ. Salvation is based on crying out for his mercy. And there's no advantage to being a particular ethnicity, uh, any skin color, any, you know, whatever. It, it, none of it matters when it comes to the fact that we stand before God. Paul says there is no difference. All have sinned, and thus we all came, come in the same humble way. So I think anyone who looks at that thoughtfully and sees the implications has to realize that, uh, you know, as the old saying goes, Houston, we have a problem here. There's, right. a, there's a real difficulty hanging on to a distinctively dispensational outlook if, in fact, 
the New Testament discounts this idea that there is a distinctive sort of special class of people that are known as Jewish people or Israel that are going to be somehow the subject of God's redemptive purposes at some point in the future. Right, exactly. And and obviously in that you can find uh, hermeneutical errors in that there there's the New Testament scriptures that you alluded to repeatedly are meant to be a commentary on these Old Testament passages. So we would interpret in this case that the New Testament would interpret the Old Testament. Yes. It's it's meant to be the further revelation. It, it interprets the promise. Uh, you know, a, a couple of different times you you cited Galatians chapter three, verse sixteen, which mm-hmm. clearly interprets the promise that was given to Abraham for us, yes. and tells us that the promise was made to Abraham and to his seed singular. And it stresses yes. the fact of. There in that the the grammar of it that it's singular, uh, so it's given to Abraham and his seed, and not only that it negates the idea that it was given to Abraham and seeds plural. Yeah. Uh, so that's a commentary right there. You know that that is an explanation of the promise that was given to Abraham. And obviously there's the allegory that's given a few chapters later where it explains right. that that um, uh, the promise was not given to Hagar and to Ishmael, that this promise was clearly just given to, uh, it passed down to Isaac, but ultimately the promise uh, was grounded in Christ. That's who it was headed right. to. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So there's, uh, there's, there's, this is a scriptural issue is, is the point that this is a, there, there's a hermeneutical problem. That's an error that persists, persist behind the scenes when they go to interpret scripture right so um so dispensationalism is is a new idea there there were forms of premillennialism as you pointed out and it's it's called in in studying theology would be historic premillennialism yeah. right. uh, but dispensationalism itself is new there is and uh nowhere in church history has it ever been found uh, in classical Christian theology, anyone teaching something similar even to yeah. dispensationalism. Isn't that yeah, the that's case? That's really true. I've, I've been challenged. I've made virtually the same statement you just made, and, and I've sometimes heard from people uh, saying, well, no, 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 there's this guy back in, I think, the second century who uh, said something about the 70th week of Daniel. So there you have it. There's dispensation. Right, right. And I've, I've asked repeatedly for the citation to the, to the specific text that says right. that. Never had a good response. I'm not doubting something like that is out there. But to be honest with you, I've read a lot of the, the, the pre-Nicene Fathers. I've never come across it. So I'm, I'd still like someone to tell me exactly where that text is. But one, you know, in one way or another, what you're saying is certainly uh, substantially correct. You don't have anything like a full or dispensational systematic theology until you get to the early 1800s. And then it comes out uh, pretty much fully formed in the work of John Darby and later Schofield and so on. Right. So it, it originated with, with John Nelson Darby, essentially. Do you mind kind of drilling down on that a little bit more? Yeah. Uh, John Nelson Darby, he was... Uh, um, uh, actually, uh, in the church in Ireland, and he had uh, uh, some falling out with the the powers that be, you know, as it were, there in Ireland, and uh, gathered around him a small cadre of men who uh, began to rethink uh, certain things, and they were doing it against the backdrop of what was happening at that time. Like I say, it was it was in Ireland, but the Second Great Awakening was a kind of a worldwide event in some ways, and it touched life yeah. and as well. And I think in part because he was disenfranchised with the uh, official church in Ireland, which was really a cousin to the Anglican church in England, he was uh, really uh, looking for some uh, alternative way of understanding his Christian faith. And he, along with uh, seven or eight other guys, uh, worked out this system over time. I think he was certainly the, the principal thinker in it that developed into dispensationalism. There's been all kinds of lore about what uh, went on there. There's stories about a, a 16-year-old girl who had a, uh, you know, kind of a vision uh, in a sort of uh, one of the Irving Night meetings. Irving was a right. kind of the Pentecostal, you know, spirit at the time, mm-hmm. and uh, and she had a vision that uh, the church would not go through the tribulation but would be raptured out of it. Well, I don't know. That's, that's been very much disputed. I'm not 
planting any stakes on that either way. But the point is there are some confusing elements to it, but be that as it may, Darby was able to write a multi-volume systematic theology. That's a pretty impressive piece of work. Yeah. And oh, he was uh, extremely he, intelligent. He was he very was, intelligent. He was a very bright guy. And so credit where credit's due. He did a lot of traveling around. He, of course, was one of the founding members of the Plymouth Brethren. He traveled to the United States, was welcomed by a Presbyterian pastor named James Brooks. He preached in his church. He had a huge influence. And that was kind of the beginnings of American dispensationalism. Uh, Schofield comes into the picture a few years later and, and does his Schofield reference Bible. But but uh, really, you have to say Darby was the creative genius that really put together this whole understanding. I think he was you know wrong, misguided, but nevertheless impressive in his way, right. in his ability to assemble. To, a, to kind of systematize this yes. this whole idea and outlook of of yeah of scripture. And I mean, it's you know, it's a it's a. It's a uh, in itself. It is a systematic theology. Yes, dispensationalism is. is, and that is extremely impressive. And then um, uh, Schofield comes along, and you could uh, consider him. He, for a lack of a better word, he kind of peddled it. Right? Yeah, uh, he was yeah. the one that propagated it or pushed it forward. Not to, you know, as I said, lack of a better word. But he didn't. He kind of push it along. Is that true? It is true. He was uh, he was actually a lawyer uh, originally, and and uh, he as a as an adult was converted to the Christian faith through the influence of James Brooks, uh, this Presbyterian, and of course Brooks was very much impressed with Darby. So that was the first exposure Schofield had was to a kind of dispensational understanding of the Christian faith. There's been some good books written about Schofield, uh, you know, if people want to hunt them down, giving a lot more detail than I can right now. But but uh, long and short of it, Schofield um, not only was a, a very powerful speaker, he traveled around and spoke, but he eventually uh, reduced to uh, writing uh, the so-called Schofield Reference Bible, which was King James Version of the Bible with a bunch of elaborate notes uh, footnotes, you might say, to texts, and in that he works out what amounts to a dispensational, really a Darby's yeah. approach, adds a few things of his own. It was published in 1910. It was republished a few years later. It just so happens that the Schofield Reference Bible hit the American evangelical bloodstream at exactly the right time to be absorbed almost overnight. Right. Because evangelicals were feeling the pressure of modernism. They were feeling that, uh, you know, the rising, the, like evolution and so on, various uh, secular ideas and explanations for human existence that left God out right. of the picture were, were really threatening to them. And they were looking for something to hang on to to explain. A it. degree of apostatizing at this point. Exactly. Uh, it, it was and, scary. And, you know, the, the Christian church yeah. was panicking at, exactly. you know, to some sense. And, and here comes Schofield's Bible and essentially says, among other things, we're living in the Laodicean age. We're living in right. the age of lukewarm Christianity. And if you don't believe it, look out your window, you know. And so all mm -hmm. of a sudden, uh, evangelicals had something they could cling to and say, well, that explains why things are going so bad. That explains why we're losing our influence in the culture. We're living in the end times and things are going bad from bad to worse. And Christ is going to come back soon. And. And so, you know, the Schofield Reference Bible was a perfect uh, sort of explanation of why things looked as bleak as they did at that time in history. Yeah, another interesting point that you made is, you know, uh, because we can't disconnect uh, the historical time period, the environment in which this is all occurring, and even the the, the language of ages and um you referred to evolution at that time. This gave an answer for many Christians who uh, ultimately abandoned uh, young earth creationism, right. uh, a view of the earth being young, and they built in these different ages earlier on, the gap theory and things of that nature, to be able to answer you know, the secularists' growing arguments about the earth being millions of years old and mm -hmm. in uh, and such. So uh, there was a lot of attacks that were coming, and they just kind of provided some of that um, uh, that response at a time when the Christian right. church felt like it was needed. Yes, exactly. Right. And and you think about, you know, the most famous single incident in that time was the 1925 Scopes trial. Right, uh, right. Became a, it became a national— in Tennessee, I believe. You know, yeah. And, of course, 
technically, uh, you know, the Christians, the good, the good guys won, you might say, you know? yeah. but, uh, but substantially, that was the time when you might say evangelical, conservative, young earth, uh, anti-evolution, Christian people lost their seat at the table. Uh, it right. was over at that point. And if you continue to maintain uh, some sort of, uh, you know, what they would regard to be a biblical outlook, you were simply right. dismissed from the conversation as some sort of right. Neanderthal who really didn't deserve yeah. to be heard. Right. Just, yeah, yeah. This is, this is kind of where, uh, the, the, it, it all began where it was birthed. The idea of the conservative Christian in whatever terms is ignorant and unsophisticated. Yeah. Exactly. Right. Yeah. And, and that is, uh, over against secularism that existing within our culture, the Christian being kind of looked down upon. Yeah. Right. So, um, uh, let me ask you a question also about, uh, uh just, uh, designations. Yeah, so, um, the idea of covenant theology, is that what you would – is that uh, the nomenclature that you would use when you would describe your belief system? Yes, uh, I, I would. I, I think um, – I mean I suppose some people have different views of what that term means exactly, right. and I try to be cautious about using too much jargon. But insofar right. as covenant theology stands for the idea – that uh, God called Abraham and made certain promises to Abraham and that those promises were going to be realized in one that, as Paul calls it, the seed of Abraham, that one would right. come who would be the great realization of the promises made to Abraham. And that is a covenant. It's a covenant of grace. Right. Uh, it's solemnized, especially in Genesis chapter 15, a unilateral covenant made to Abraham. He's sound asleep. He's passive in that covenant-cutting ceremony. The promises are all made to him, and right. he's the recipient of them. And what he brings to the table is faith. And faith is not a work. Faith is simply his humble acceptance of promises that God made, and really, in many ways, is is based on the predicate that I have no <laughs> nothing I can bring. I have no right. <laughs> uh, pr price I can pay for this. This is simply God's promise to me. And well, it's a beautiful, isn't that a beautiful introduction of yeah. the covenant of grace? Exactly. He's sleeping, literally, you know, during, yeah. during the time period of the covenant being uh, uh, consummated or, yeah. or put into practice, at least instituted. Right. Yeah, that's and, interesting. And so it, uh, you know, and, and that was uh, whatever, you know, let's say, uh, you know, 1500, uh, more, more like in very round numbers, say 2000 BC, you know, I've, uh, people quibble over the date, but in, in round numbers, you would say that, well, Christ is 2000 years in the future. And so we have a whole history of God's dealings with his people who are the physical, biological descendants of Abraham, for the most part, that certainly is the case in the Old Testament. And those promises are renewed, and they are restated and, and embellished. It, exact, right. They're sort of uh, emphasized, and there's an augmentation of them. Uh, but it was easy, of course, for, for uh, Israel, for Jewish people through history to think that the reason God was treating them so specially was because they were so special, <laughs> you know, that, right. that they had some kind of... Uh, of a special claim to uh in, to in spite of god it, god even um clarifying to to them that it was nothing special about them that's right, you, that's you, right. he, and, he 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 knows our propensity towards pride and he commands to our weakness knowing yeah. that they would eventually fall into that yeah exactly so you know paul explains in galatians that god added the law as a schoolmaster to kind of herd the people of god down through history to christ and Isaiah especially, but other Old Testament prophets make it clear that with the coming of Messiah, uh, there, there's an explosion of God's redemptive campaign going to the world. Right. The Gentiles are going to come to Zion. I mean, the, this whole idea that the, that the ultimate uh, expression of God's purposes is not going to be distinctively Jewish at all. It's right. going to be something that goes to the world. That's in the Old Testament, clearly enough. Oh, but yeah. I mean, the whole you, latter portion of Isaiah, I would say. Exactly. Uh, the exactly. whole the whole second half of the book of Isaiah is slanted towards yes. the new covenant, yes. 
Christ, and yeah. and even when you, it builds to Isaiah fifty three, the most famous uh, prophecy of the Old Testament, the yes. suffering servant. It uh, who when it, when in the the opening verse when it's asking the question, who hath believed our report? The whole idea is that the Jews, his own people, have rejected him. No one believed it. That was that was the point. Yeah. yeah. And so when we come to the New Testament and and the apostles and the followers of Christ begin to uh, pitch that point, you know, that the gospel is for the Gentiles, it meets with a firestorm because, in fact, uh, there was so much pride of ownership among, uh, you know, in the Jewish nation. And obviously right. that uh, created a, a fair amount of hostility. Paul, uh, you know, being the apostle to the Gentiles was about all they could stand. And, and so, you know, that, that's kind of the the drama of the new testament is trying to emphasize hey this message is not simply your private possession here it's got right exactly yeah and and you can really see this attitude this this sort of uh th th it's a sin of course that they had but this mentality that the jews carried all throughout even the old testament where they began to think of themselves more highly than many of the mm -hmm. other nations that were around them um you know by the time christ shows up it's as if he's preaching to the same former generations. They're acting in the exact same way, the way in which they're treating the Samaritans at that point. And uh, yet they had uh, um, misunderstood. Obviously, with God's clarification, they had misunderstood the purpose of themselves as a nation was to be a light to the world. Yeah. And obviously, you know, they were they were entrusted mm -hmm. Um, with they were you know it, uh, you could really use the the term dispensation there in, in its in its true sense, uh, but they were entrusted with um, uh, all the things that the Christian church is entrusted with today, which is a blessing, and their job was to be a light to the to all the and nations yet, round about. Even in the Old Testament, you see the the fact that there is the fundamental theme of the just shall live by faith. Even the Old right. Testament, faith is the centerpiece of true, uh, you know, uh, obedience uh, to the truth of God. Right, and to so the truth the, of God, right. The, the Old Testament distinguishes a, a circumcision of the body from a circumcision of the heart. Right, the book of and, Ezekiel, uh, speaks, for example. Ezekiel talks about replacing a heart of stone with a heart of flesh. Those are all Old right. Testament themes. So it should not have come as a big shock, you know. Right, that, yeah, that yeah, and then again— yeah, we have the, the New Testament again giving us a commentary, uh, you know, pointing back and um, uh, uh, explaining to us how Abraham was saved, how David yeah. was saved. In, there in Romans 4, the Apostle Paul right. uh, details their salvation being by faith. Yeah, exactly. And then you have even the scriptures that Paul, when he presents his arguments, he's writing uh, uh, to, uh, to an audience that accepts the Old Testament as authoritative. Therefore, he utilizes, you know, that's that's what that's what he uses to his advantage is Old Testament scripture. He proved his point that salvation, and that just shows that dispensationalism isn't even something on his mind. Right. Uh, that's uh, that shows that that's not even that's not even something he needs to deal with because he can just openly appeal to Old Testament scripture prove that man was saved by faith in the old testament and then they understand you know logic the the conclusion from that is that we are saved by faith as well exactly. today That's yeah exactly the just right. shall live by faith is a quotation <laughs> right yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. And that was actually one of the other questions that I was going to ask you was about, obviously, uh, a, a, a part and parcel with dispensationalism. Not all dispensationalists, to be fair, um, would would hold to uh, dispensational salvation. So there are there are many dispensationalists that would believe in and adhere to a form of dispensationalism. But nonetheless, they would believe that man was you know, saved by faith. Mm -hmm. Uh, from the beginning of time, yeah. but they would still kind of cut up and uh, right. the different time periods and believe that that God dealt with man differently. But yeah, that is that is one of the major themes that I believe um, a allows there to be more continuity from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible when it comes to covenant theology. That that form of interpretation it makes much more sense of that, and you can um, you can walk through the Bible uh, side by side. You see grace. And the law, grace yeah. and works, beginning right. going all the way back to the Garden of Eden. We can see the law being given uh, regarding the, the the tree of life, and then we see grace immediately given. And then even with Cain and Abel, right after that, we see the law, 
We see grace, or we see works, you might say, and we see grace and and faith, right? Yeah, so um, so I, I read a book you may be familiar with it. It's called The Rise and Fall of Dispensationalism, fairly recent, yeah. by a fellow named Hummel, H-U-M-M-E-L. And uh, it's, it's an interesting treatment of the history of dispensationalism. And he talks about how, uh, and, and by the way, for those who may not be familiar with it, it's a, it's a quite even-handed book. It, it sounds like it's going to be very hostile to dispensational. It really isn't. It's, it's written, I think, in a way that any dispensational reader would realize he's giving a fair shake to the history of this movement. Right. And, um, and, but one of the things he points out is that there has been a fragmentation of dispensational views. Of course, Charles Ryrie famously wrote the book Dispensationalism Today, right. back in the 60s, already making huge adjustments mm -hmm. from the original uh -huh. Schofield version of dispensationalism. And right. since that time, Hal Lindsey and his work, and then the Left Behind series, and, and the kind of popularizing of dispensational thought has led at the same time to a sort of diminution of its of its uh, integrity. You, mm -hmm. you, you've got little bits and pieces of it. The rapture is still a, something that right. you're the Antichrist. You know, you've got these kind of terms of art that belong to dispensationalism, but the systematic underpinnings have been somewhat uh, uh, loosened up so that any given dispensationalism may have quite different views from someone else on some pretty right. fundamental ideas. Uh, and I, I think that's almost necessary because, in fact, you have a system that is not consistent with the Bible. And all right, the exactly. Case, it's going to start fragmenting sooner or later. It has to. Yeah, because and, uh, the Bible is consistent with itself. Exactly. Right. So, so, so if your system isn't consistent with the Bible, you're going to have a lot of trouble. Which yeah. that's a great point to point. You know, uh, and 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 um, I, I haven't read the book, but I have watched uh, some of some videos and some discourse that he's that he's done with oh, other okay, people on that topic on YouTube. Yeah, but um, yeah, exactly. So you'll have some sets of of uh, some stripes of dispensationalists that will um, look at the Olivet discourse and they will be able to tell, hey, this has been fulfilled. They'll put mm -hmm. that in the past. Yeah. Then right. other dispensationalists who would hold more so to a hard line of the distinction <laughs> of the programs, how you put it, right. for the church in Israel, um, which really seems to be uh, uh, the, uh, to use your terminology from before, the linchpin of dispensationalism when I see it, right? If I step back and look at uh, the, 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 the framework of dispensationalism, it seems to me that the purpose is to separate out the two programs for right. Israel and the church. Yeah. And I and I think it 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 it's it as a as a system it's easier to to have a, a, an adhere an adhering program if they do that. Not to say that it's going to be consistent because I don't believe that it's a biblical interpretation of of scripture either. But uh, yeah, it, the purpose being to separate out the two programs, Matthew 24 ultimately being fulfilled. So the kingdom of God still being offered, it being rejected by the Jews, right. but then postponed and to be offered later. So that yeah. program doesn't change as far as it is still something that will be physical and will occur on earth right. Uh, and fulfilled through physical Israel. Yes, exactly. Right. Yes. Yeah, so of this, from a from a dispensational point of view, they they would uh, lay the their what they would regard as their trump card down and say, well, how do you explain the fact that there's a state of Israel today? Doesn't that prove you know everything we've been saying? And right, and it's impressive that uh, there's a state of Israel, but I don't think it's I don't think it's legitimate to let uh, events at any time in history interpret the Bible. We're supposed to let right. interpret events and. And when we turn that around, we can we can bring all we can import into the Bible all kinds of filters that prevent us from seeing what the Bible otherwise says pretty plainly. Right. And so even though we always, you know, there's never been a time in history that people didn't believe that events were lining up, proving that Christ was about to return. Martin Luther believed that Christ was probably about to return. You know, it was mm -hmm. it was uh, pretty much a consistent theme of uh, of a great deal of human history. The Puritans thought that the great work that was happening in their movement uh, marked maybe, you know, that we're living toward the end times, that kind of thing. Uh, 
but uh, but the the uh, temptation we have to interpret the Bible in light of what I read in this morning's newspaper is is pretty beguiling and seductive. We should be you know pretty cautious about that. Yeah, yeah, we, yeah, definitely. We should we should uh, be wary of our biases when it comes to that. There's a couple of things that I was thinking that uh, may you know. It's my guess is of the psychology behind it, but nonetheless, Christians looking forward to Christ come, whether whatever position that it is, ah, yeah. mill, post mill, pre mill. We it's the blessed hope, and we look forward to the return of Christ. That could be one thing of that causing us to lean into it, and then also yeah. the always reading ourselves into, yeah. Uh, yeah, the you know the most important events. You yes. know, it could be our our Adam nature, the first Adam nature there as well. Um, well we are. But, uh, we- that's that. That is, I think that may be one of the most, uh, uh, you know, beguiling temptations we have. We want to see ourselves as the center of everything. Right. We're living at yep. the critical moment in human history. It's never been like it is right now, and and that's sort of an arrogant view. It ignores all that God has done in history, and it really ignores all that God may want to do in future history. Right. Uh, to put ourselves at the center of, of you know, whatever's happening. I, I, I think we need to be a little more modest in our estimation. Of Absolutely. Our yeah. Yeah, I was going to use the word uh, egocentric. Uh, yeah, that's <laughs> so, right. Yeah, that's that's the the term that I was that I was originally going to use, uh, and how we tend to be e- egocentric. Yeah. Um, so, uh, what would you say is the weakest point of dispensationalism? I'll ask that first, and then afterwards, if you don't mind, just kind of segueing or flowing right into um, uh, the 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 idea of uh, what do you think is the most dangerous part of dispensationalism as yeah. well. Well, I, I think the most vulnerable point is what we mentioned, that it, it tries to create a distinction where God doesn't allow it, uh, to say that there's still a distinct status uh, for Jewish people. And, and out of that flow, all kinds of interpretive gymnastics. I mean, to say that the 70th week of Daniel is detached indefinitely from the first 69 weeks, that's necessary to keep dispensationalism alive. But textually, hermeneutically, it's really hard to justify that particular, right. uh, you know, view of things. And, and there's all kinds of things like that where you have to kind of bring your a priori to the text and use those to interpret what the text otherwise seems to, you know, say in a much in a plainly different direction. So right. I would say that that's um, uh, that's kind of the heart. I remember when I was teaching, you know, when I first went uh, right out of college. I bluffed my way into a teaching gig in a little uh, kind of uh, Bible school here in Spokane. Doesn't exist anymore, but it was uh, around for about 20 years or so. And when I first went to work there, I was a dispensationalist and the the uh, uh, school was dispensational. In fact, I had to sign a doctrinal statement every year reaffirming that I embrace dispensational views without mental reservation. That was what was the language on this thing. What, it actually said without mental reservation? Without mental reservation. Wow. <laughs> so that was, that was the requirement. That's interesting. And uh, what I found, I was one of my teaching assignments was the book of Romans. And what I found is that, and church history, uh, both of those and some others as well. But uh, but those two books in combination with each other really did rattle my cage. Uh, I had a hard time explaining Paul's uh, theology, especially in chapters 9, 10, and 11, uh, where he's clearly arguing the question, who are the true people of God? Who right, are Right, exactly. They? And he makes the point rather emphatically that they are those whom God has chosen. That's why the whole question right. of the election comes up, you know, it's because it's, it's God who chooses. It's not the man who wills or the man who runs. It's right. God who makes this. And so uh, as the years went by, and then teaching church history was the other thing. I'd grown up dispensational. I didn't know. didn't teach this, Thomas Aquinas didn't teach this, Martin Luther didn't teach this, uh, you know, Jonathan Edwards didn't teach this, Calvin didn't teach it, the Puritans didn't, you know, I mean, in other words, all of the great thinkers in history would never have heard of dispensationalism. Right. It, it made me, uh, it, 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 it gave me increasing anxiety 
Yeah, I, I, yeah. I mean, that should definitely make you a little yeah. apprehensive. Yeah. yeah, I mean, the idea of Joseph Smith, you know, as we talked about before, uh, coming up with these brand new revelations that right. no one in church history has ever believed before. Now, people right. may have their reservations about church history from some respect, but nonetheless, if you can't find anyone That's right. in church history at all, that should that should scare you. That's right. It's a little sobering, and and yeah. I. Uh, I, I was very uh, blessed to, I think it was the year was 1966 uh, or 67. I, no, no, that's right, 70. Uh, uh, see, I'm, I'm getting old enough. I can't remember my dates. This was in the <laughs> mid-70s, so it was 1977. I had the opportunity to meet personally R.C. Sproul, who I'm that's sure you're cool. familiar with. Yes. I went back to the, what was called the Ligonier Valley Study Center. It was in Stallstown, Pennsylvania. This before they moved to Florida. And I had, uh, it was a wonderful opportunity and, and had a couple of lengthy conversations with him. And he, he was the one who assured me that even though I was unsettled with, the, with my convictions concerning dispensationalism, that there was a whole rich tradition of church history that would welcome me. And uh, you know, he was, he was kind of like the guy that kind of pushed me over the edge, I would say, a little bit. But I, I was already there. I just needed somebody that I trusted to assure me that I wasn't becoming a heretic. Yeah, but, right, you know, right. To, to depart from that particular set of uh, assumptions. Right. And so you said it was the book of Romans, chapter 9, 10, 11. I know you said I, did, I missed. What was the other book? Well, it was Teaching Church History. Uh, oh, I, Teaching Church History. Okay. Yeah, teaching yeah. Church History, history and the Book of and, Romans. And the I Book taught, of Romans. Okay. Yeah. I taught both of those probably every year for about seven or eight straight years. And I started the seven years as a dispensational. By the time I ended in 1980, I had to politely and very amicable a departure from the school. But I just told them, you know, I can't, I can't buy this anymore. And I right. Really, Conscience wise. Yeah, that's right. And right. You letter. could really make some uh, dispensationalists uh, <laughs> upset with that former part that, uh, uh, you know, effectively what you're saying is that the Bible made yeah. you reject dispensationalism. <laughs> yeah. Essentially, that's right. I, I, I yeah. remember facing <laughs> the question more than once. Uh, this was not in, in Romans, but in Galatians. Uh, this whole seed of Abraham thing. I mean, it, it's Paul is pretty pointed there in chapter three. And, and I know the question came up once, I remember quite distinctly, well, I thought the Jewish people were the seed of Abraham, but Paul says mm -hmm. this, and what about that? And, right. you know, if you try to answer that question honestly, it leaves you in a little bit of, uh, I remember at the time I was, right. I was uh, coming up with, there must be two seeds of Abraham, and, you know, blah, blah, blah. You right. Of, uh, kind of yeah, you have to do that. And sometimes you don't even realize that you're, that you are participating in, in those mental gymnastics, yeah. because especially if you're doing it in uh in genuine faith right and you know you're attempting to harmonize some things and you've truly bought into um you know the system of dispensationalism right. and that's the only filter or lens that you yeah. have to look at the bible to you the other option is yeah is the bible not being true yeah, it's exactly. not being the revelation of god yeah i grew up in a dispensationalist church I, by the time that I, I started taking you know my bible study seriously um, and i really wanted to uh, uh make my faith my own i was about 19 or 20 and by the time i was 21 i had read the bible through a couple of times probably three or four times and um I started just kind of realizing that a lot of the things I was hearing taught in mm -hmm. in Bible study just didn't feel as if, you know, if, if that I could set it right over top and they were they would harmonize one another right. that 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 they that they mirrored one another and and um, it was the book of Galatians for me um, mm -hmm. the book of yep. Galatians and and um, as we've alluded to it a couple of times it's almost as if it's the purpose. Yeah. Uh, of the of that book, yeah. um, Romans eleven as well. You reference yeah. Romans chapter nine through eleven, uh, but Romans eleven uh, is is a powerful chapter refuting dispensationalism, and yeah. and it actually shows uh, uh, why we should not use the poor language. I, I, I'm assuming that you would. Um, I'll put this out there, but I'm assuming that you would agree with this of referring to it as replacement theology. Oh yeah, no, I I, um, I have more than once publicly repudiated that because I've been right. accused, you know. Right. And I would say, no, nothing's being replaced here. You know? Right. 
the whole principle of justification by faith is plainly in the Old Testament, and we're not saying anything other than that. So, right, uh, you know, maybe the demographics of Israel has changed, but but Israel in the Old Testament, true Israel, was always people of faith. Right, exactly. In the New Testament, is people mm -hmm. of faith. It's it's so that nothing's being replaced. Uh, we just see that there's more Gentiles today who are part of true Israel than would have been right. Yeah. Testament. Yeah, you might even say the ratio of Israel changed, given the yeah. amount of time, right? Because exactly. uh, uh, that's why it's not a replacing. Um, yeah. Uh, so the olive tree, what has happened? It's the same olive tree. Yes. You just have now taken these these wild branches, yeah. and <laughs> right. and those have been added. Yeah, so, uh, but it's the same olive tree, the same promises of the Old Testament. They are just fulfilled in Christ. These things, the new covenant is the better covenant. It's the fulfillment of all of the things of, of the old covenant. Yeah, exactly. And you even see Christ um, trying to give these reminders to the Jews uh, in the book of Luke when they're going to push him off the cliff. The, the whole reason that they get angry, the idea of thinking that they're the, you know, the, the, the special people above all else. Uh, in, in an ethnocentric way, uh, you know, he's reminding them that didn't Elisha go, wasn't he sent to the widow woman? Yeah. So this yeah, took place in the Old Testament. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, Sarepta in, in the Old Testament and then Zarephath, yeah, in the New Testament. And yeah, um, yeah. And then he, he, he mentions Naaman. He goes mm -hmm. through a few different people that in the Old yeah. Testament who were essentially, you could say, during Old Testament uh, time period that is with the covenant yeah. that was made with Israel, they were added to that olive tree, yeah. albeit at the time of the old covenant. Well, that's right, and and you know I've I've uh, I think it's impressive that Israel is is not simply called the chosen nation in the Old Testament, but but they're also called a priestly nation. Right. They were, and, and their temple is a house of prayer for the nations. There was right. Even Old Testament, there was a, an idea of a vision for being, as it were, the central sanctuary, not just for themselves, but for the world. And, and all we find in the New Covenant is that particular idea is finally given its full orbed expression, but, but it was yeah. already there. Israel was supposed to be a pastor to the yeah. nation and give the truth of God to the nations and invite them in. And, and uh, and it, it, unfortunately, they didn't do that very well, but it was certainly part right. of their calling in the Old Testament. Yeah, the only time I can think of in the Old Testament where, where Israel um, came, came close to fulfilling that, um, in the what would be the glory days of Israel, of Solomon, and what yeah. we have during that time period yeah. uh, is— there were there were multitudes of of gen, the Gentiles were coming as Isaiah kind of prophesies of the Gentiles yeah. are coming to Jerusalem they're coming and worshiping uh, in the temple and yeah yeah and uh, Jonah is a missionary he goes to the Gentiles right. so he's a good example too a little yeah. bit of that yeah. <laughs> yeah that's that's exactly right when when um when I was um I I wouldn't I don't know if I would ever term myself as dispensationalist uh, uh, in the sense that that I had committed myself to the the belief system of dispensationalism. But there was a time period where I definitely tried to interpret the Bible through that. And if you would have asked me, I would have said that I was a dispensationalist. Okay. And, and during that time, I was totally blind to all of the times mm -hmm. in Scripture where God sent prophets to the nations— mm -hmm. Yeah. And that would have been looking back when you when you said that the first thing that I thought of um you know kind of uh, retrospect my own mindset that would have been so foreign to me the idea <laughs> of of Jonah going and preaching to right. uh, this Gentile nation this heathen nation but we have it. It was actually pretty foreign to Jonah, actually. You, you yeah, know? and you know what? He had a very similar attitude that the Jews had at the time when Christ showed up. Yeah, uh, and then and even still, in the end, he's upset that God's having mercy on them. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, and um, we even have in the book of Isaiah uh, a whole section that theologians refer to as the burden of nations. Mm -hmm. And what's the purpose that God would send a prophet, you know, the prophet Isaiah, to go and preach to this nation? It's the same purpose he would send Jonah. It's the same purpose he would send uh, uh, any preacher to you know, right. uh, Isaiah to Israel, and obviously to give them space to repent. Yeah. 
exactly. Showing his love and his care and his mercy for all of the nations, and yes. and and obviously had a special place the, uh, with the old covenant for Israel, and a special job, you might say. But um, still, of course, loving all nations, all people, all tongues, uh, and caring for the salvation of all. So, uh, so I think you we we touched on what is the the weak point the weakest point and um you would explain that as just being in light of new testament scripture that you, there's really no way to to harmonize the two when you when you have just the plain uh, uh statements in the new testament um what would you say uh would be the most dangerous i don't know if we got to that well, there if you yeah, could flesh that I, out what's the most dangerous part of dispensationalism it and does, obviously it, being fair and balanced of course yeah I, it seems to me that that the the effect it has on a person's outlook uh, is is something. When I was in college, um, you know, this is 1968. I heard Hal Lindsey speak before he was famous, before he wrote his book, and he was still with Campus Crusade for Christ, and he was speaking on a college campus not too far away. And I went and heard him, and the, it was a series of talks he gave college students. A great speaker, you know. And uh, the last of them was a was a, a, a talk on on well, basically that we're living in the end times. This was in 1968, and in that speech, he uh, asserted, I remember it very well, that he couldn't imagine that the return of Christ would be any later than 1975. He said, "No man knows the day or the hour." So you know, don't get me wrong here, but as, but as far as I'm concerned, I just can't conceive. Uh, everything's lining up. All of the geopolitical acti activity in the world just makes it perfectly clear that that's well. The effect it had on me, I almost dropped out of college. I believed the man. I believed that what he was saying was was you know here's a guy. He's a theologian. He's a you know impressive speaker and so on. And uh, I think that's what happens when people really believe that things are going from bad to worse. For one thing, that we're living in the end times. Uh, then they tend to detach from long-term planning. Uh, they, you know, I, I think it's safe to say that evangelical Christians tended to detach from yeah. political involvement in our nation, and we left it to the pagans to, you know, take over our country. And, right, and, the universities we've pulled exactly. out of, you know, exactly. yeah. yeah, and still sending our children to the universities, but yeah. allowing the secularists to educate them. Exactly, right. So I, I think it's the practical effect that I would sort of point at as maybe the biggest downside to a dispensational outlook. I mean, I, I believe that God's kingdom is growing, that uh, it grows in fits and starts for sure, that, you know, we have uh, setbacks occasionally, but generally speaking, over the long haul, there's a growth of the kingdom that a time is going to come when the knowledge of God covers the earth as the waters cover the sea that Jesus told us to make disciples of the nations. He promised to be with us uh, to the end of the age. I take that to mean to the end of the project, that there's going to be a, a continual advance of the gospel until the time comes when we can say that it's mission accomplished. And uh, that gives me hope. It gives me a reason to invest in my kids and grandkids and great grandkids that I may never meet, but I want to, right. I want to do what I can to have a positive influence in the lives of generations to come. It, it really changes your whole view of what it is to be a Christian person working in the world towards some great uh, uh, outcome, a trajectory of glorifying Christ in history. Right, that's exciting. Yeah, so um, it, it seems inevitable as we speak. And I, I in the beginning, I, I, uh, well, it was kind of meant to be a forerunner for the conversation because I anticipated it. But it's inevitable to to um, uh, try to disconnect dispensationalism with premillennialism because even in that conversation there. Um, where we we headed towards was the idea of what what really was the danger in that sense of um, the uh, uh, dispensationalism, the talk that you had heard from Hal Lindsey. And what was it? Was Hal Lindsey the late great planet Earth? Is that correct? Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah he, he wrote that book, I want to say, in about 1970. So it was about two years after. And of course, okay. it, became, it became a New York Times bestseller for weeks on end. Right had an un incalculable impact yeah. on our nation. And, uh, and it, 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 I think it, it, in many ways you would say that uh, since that time, Hal Lindsey has just had to be scrambling to keep intact the right. great uh, 
because virtually nothing he said in the late great planet Earth actually turned out to be what he predicted. You know, he was wrong on all yeah. points. But uh, nevertheless, the book was so successful, he's been faced with the task of trying to keep propping it up by various revisions of what's happening in the world and so on. Right. Yeah. So here towards the end, I don't want to keep you, you too long. Um if if you don't mind, since we've 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 kind of um, walked down this road, and this is the point we've gotten to a couple of different times, and 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 if you're able, I would love to have you back on and speak more sure. extensively on the topic of of uh, eschatology and post millennialism. But uh, if you could, could you demonstrate in in some way or another uh, scripturally and and with whatever arguments um, uh, you feel fit of how covenant theology connects with a post-millennial view um, or a partial preterist view or whatever that would be, the positions that you hold? Yeah. Well, it, it, I mean, I would start an answer to that with just the Great Commission. Once again, we just mentioned it, but Jesus uh, declares his universal authority. All authority has been given unto me, all authority in heaven and on earth. Uh, so he's, he's just claimed uh a totality of ownership of all things human, everything, governmental authority, educational authority, church authority, you name it, authority, family authority, all of it, you know, it's all right. mine. And then he gives marching orders, go make disciples of the nations. Right. Uh, yeah. He, and that's the consequence of the authority, yeah, like you exactly. said. Exactly. That's right. right. So the king is giving his mandate Go make disciples, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. Uh, I'm with you always to the end of the world. And that promise to be with us is a promise to give us what we need to implement what he's commanded us to do. Right. Uh, and so it does seem to me that we should have at least a, a, an expectation that this project is going to be successful. You uh, wind up in 1 Corinthians 15, where, where we have an idea that this kingdom is growing, and a time will come when, when Jesus can, in a sense, give the kingdom back to the Father and say, mission accomplished, right. uh, we got it done, uh, and there is this uh, notion that the kingdom has been growing. You know, I, no man knows the day or the hour. I'll use that in myself. I don't think Christ is... Christ could return tomorrow afternoon, so I'm, I'm aware right. of that, but my actual conviction is that I'm going to die, that I'm going to, you know, go through that experience, and that other people are as well, uh, and that the Christian movement may continue for thousands of years into the future. That, uh, so you, you made an interesting point, if you don't mind, uh, uh, if yeah. I kind of say something in parentheses real quick. Uh, my audience may not be familiar with the fact that there could be still a form of eminence that's held with a position that is yeah. amillennial or postmillennial, right? With the second coming of Christ. Yeah, it's true. I, I, I think we are, we should have a sense of expectancy, but I don't want Jesus to come back and find me on the top of a mountain in a white robe doing nothing, waiting for his right. return. I think that would be a colossal breach <laughs> yeah. of my fiduciary duties. I want him to come back finding me as busy as I can be building mm -hmm. his kingdom. And, uh, and I think that's the way Christian people should be thinking about it. Uh, so my, my practical conviction is that this is a job that's just getting underway. I, I was about to say earlier that some people say we're living in a post-Christian era. Uh, I always dispute that. I say, no, no, we're living in a pre-Christian era. We haven't seen the world swamped by the influence of the Christian message yet. But that there is an air of expectancy in the New Testament that this uh, work is is going to continue and that there's going to be a a, a rising uh, response to the gospel through history I think is is virtually dripping from every page my one of my great heroes is Jonathan Edwards uh, great Puritan preacher of course who wrote extensively on this and he was he was one of the great Puritan post-millennial for example and he he just speculated about all the ways in which he thought, uh, the influence of the gospel was going to uh, change the course of history, uh, medical advances, scientific advances, technological advances. He really, you know, kind of lets his imagine, uh, imagination run wild. <clears throat> and the fact is, when we look at the testimony of history, we find that the Christian movement has been responsible for huge advances mm 
uh, in virtually every area of legitimate Christian endeavor. Right. It yeah, and that, that is that is truly an um, just uh, an amazing um, observation that if we just look around at the world today, we and and we look at first world countries, third world countries, we we look at the advances. We look everything can be essentially attributed to Christianity. Everything, yeah. uh, uh, it, it just literature, music. Yeah. I mean, all of these advances all stem from uh, Christianity. Yeah, exactly. There's a great book written a few years ago, you may be familiar with it, in, entitled Under the Influence by a fellow named Alvin Schmidt. And he just- I'll have to look that up. He documents, uh, it's an easy read. It's about 300 pages long, but it's easy reading, a wonderful reading. And he just goes through how it's the Christian movement that worked for the abolition of the gladiator games back. It was the Christian right. that elevated the status of women. It's the Christian movement that has consistently campaigned against slavery, for example. Mm -hmm. And right. uh, the Christian movement, again, I mean, obviously, we've got black eyes in our history. Nobody die, denies that. Of course. But teaching of the Christian movement has again and again been at the forefront, the cutting edge of helping us do things better. And and we don't need to apologize for that. We have a wonderful history that that is, uh, you know, just documents that virtually. Uh, and, and so it's a great book, Under the Influence is the title, and, and uh, I think your listeners would uh, really enjoy reading that, just to, just to prove the point I'm making here. You know. Yeah, some of the, the uh, passages that uh, in the Old Testament attributed to the reign of Christ, wherein um, we see the, the benefits of uh, the, the prosperity and the peace in the world, the spirit ultimately behind, uh, even, even things that, that uh, hint at improvements in agriculture and all sorts of oh, things. Sure. Absolutely. Right. Right. Yeah. You think about, you think about the parables of Jesus, how many of them were parables that were describing something that smart starts small and grows. Right. The parable of the mustard seed, the parable of the leaven in the lump of dough, you know, the, this, the idea that the kingdom is a growing thing. It doesn't grow in a spectacular way with all kinds of fireworks that sort of thing for the most part it's insidious it's slow it's steady but uh when jesus says it eventually grows to be such a, a large plant that birds come and nest in its branches that right kind of thing. you think about daniel chapter two and a little right that grows yeah. and grows till it dominates the world it just seems like that's the flavor of biblical yeah. Expectation. Yeah, it grows into a great mountain that exactly. fills the whole earth. Yeah, in Daniel exactly. 2. And then um, even even um, in Isaiah chapter number 9, obviously celebrating Christmas, uh, you know, this is a, a, a common verse that we'll quote. It's a popular verse at that time. Isaiah 9, 6, immediately following verse 7 tells us that the increase of his kingdom yes. – shall have yeah. no end exactly. yeah so um just the same idea that's kind of laced through there that we can see that when the kingdom comes and the kingdom comes according to isaiah 9 6 um the time of his birth it points us to the time the first coming the first advent of when the messiah comes okay well let's um if you don't mind i'll, I'll have uh, like i said i don't want to take up too much of your time so we're kind of moving towards the finality here and i would love to have you back but let me ask you this if you had one verse um for your position because um that's one thing that I'm gonna I'm gonna attempt to do on this podcast is bring different people on and just discuss fairly and in a balanced way their positions, what they believe, and uh, a question that that I would like to ask for your position, which is post millennial, correct? It would be partial mm -hmm. preterism, mm -hmm. uh, fall under that header, and then specifically, more specifically, would be uh, post millennial position. If you had one passage, let's say, mm -hmm. to kind of widen it somewhat, uh, to to uh, be your evidence or your proof of, of yeah. uh, a proof text? What would it be for post-millennialism? <laughs> well, uh, several come to mind, but the one that uh, <laughs> I at the top of my list right at the moment, at least, uh, you know, in, in Revelation uh, chapter uh, 21, John says, uh, there was no temple in the city for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. There will be no more night, because the light of the Lamb and the, the, the Father will light it up. I'm roughly paraphrasing it, of course. Right. And uh, But you read that paragraph. People read that, and of course, their knee-jerk reaction to say it's describing heaven. But if it's describing heaven, then why does he say the kings of the earth bring their splendor into it? 
why does he say the nations, plural, walk in its light? Uh, why is the language that's used there manifestly not describing an eternal heavenly condition, but it's actually describing uh, the experience of, of life on this planet in normal history in which the increasing influence of the gospel is being recognized. And in fact, in history, the kings of the earth have brought their splendor into it. The greatest music, the greatest art, uh, the greatest expressions of human creativity have virtually always been <clears throat> reflecting uh, the Christian message. Absolutely. It's, it's the dark, uh, meaningless art that celebrates the forces of hell. But right. When you look for beauty, when you look for the stunning display of the greatest of the human spirit, it, you know, virtually always you're looking at some kind of Christian expression. It'll flow out of a Christian heart. Uh, exactly. Yeah, that you can exactly. trace so it back I, I think to. That, that, that paragraph to me kind of captures it. If a person will detach it from some kind of seeing it as heaven and really see it as, as exactly what's happening in history, I think it's very encouraging. Right, yeah. If they if they were to lay aside the the presuppositions or you know exactly. the other idea of right. interpretation of the Book of Revelation, yeah. yeah. And um, if you if you don't mind, um, uh, Bruce, could you give kind of a plug for yourself? Just let everybody know where they can find you. You have uh, just plentiful resources online of all different sorts of uh, of different different topics that you present, playlists and everything on YouTube, and I know you have a website as well. Do you mind just kind of giving a plug for that and uh, telling everybody quickly what that is? Well, I, yeah, I appreciate your mentioning it, but uh, yeah, the easiest way is just uh, to go to YouTube. I'm, I've got stuff I'm uploading on Rumble, so I know some people don't like YouTube uh, for whatever reason. <laughs> I, yeah. I kind of, you know, my own theory is I like to work on the mission field. I like to, you know, so yeah. as, long, as long as YouTube doesn't give me the boot, I'm going to, you know, keep right. focusing there. But anyway, you go to YouTube, type in my name, Bruce Gore, G-O-R-E, in the, in, the, uh, in the search field there, and uh, I'll be the first thing to pop up. And all the playlists are there, all of that. So it's been, you know, I have to say I'm, I'm really stunned and staggered. Uh, I've had, I think it's sometime somewhere around 10 million views now of various videos, 50,000 or more subscribers. You know, what am I? I'm just, I, I'm just a normal guy, retired guy. I take out the garbage. I mean, I, you know, I'm just about <laughs> as normal as anybody you've ever met. Uh, but this has been a bee in my bonnet. And, and to see how God has blessed it has just been staggering and, a, and an overwhelming uh, source of joy to me. So I, I invite any of your folks that want to access any of that. Uh, I hope they'll do so. Bruce, I don't know how normal you are, and, and I think you admitted as much because uh, there was a, a particular uh, – I can't remember which, which episode it was uh, or which class it was, I guess I should say, because you were teaching the philosophy course. And you, you spoke about I, – I believe this, this was also related now that I think about it the paradox uh, conversation. Mm. And you were talking about how you had a truck, <laughs> yeah. you know, I and you said when normal kids are out there playing. Yeah. That's, that's a, uh, an interesting antidote from your life there. Antidote. But uh, yeah. Well, it, it, I, to me at the time it seemed normal. I mean, it seemed know, so. normal. Yeah. <laughs> I guess everybody thinks they're normal though too. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I would say the same thing about myself. So, yeah. all righty. So uh, Bruce, I really appreciate having you come on. And like I said, uh, hopefully not, too far uh, in the future, I would like to have you on and and focus more on the topic of uh, post millennialism in okay, specific. So, great. I would love to talk about that, and uh, we can kind of go through the scriptural argument. We can speak about uh, uh, who has held this position. Obviously, um, there are a lot of people who would hold an amillennial position that is optimistic that gets very close and kind of looks mm -hmm. like a post millennial position right. without uh, if you um, those that are familiar with it will know what i mean but without kind of coming down all the way and touching earth right. and which is one of the things that the post millennial position is is capable of doing at least uh, even opponents would have to give that to them that it's it's um uh, it it is able to make sense of some of the scriptures uh, that that come down and they they speak yeah. in more of a physical manner. So, sure. um, I would like to have you on and discuss post millennialism and maybe 
uh, there was a few people that had heard of you when I had announced this, and they reached out to me, and they had some some more difficult passages that they were they were curious if I could ask oh, okay. you about. Maybe, sure. yeah, I could uh, I could kind of throw some hard uh, some hard passages if you don't yeah. mind at you, and and just to get your response to those passages, and then just kind of walk through some of the biblical texts that are significant, the Olivet Discourse and, and things along those lines. I, I would really appreciate that and kind of moving in that direction if that works out. Sure. I'm sure we can do it. You bet. All righty. Well, God bless you, uh, Bruce. Right, I really you. appreciate it. Again, I'm honored to have you on. Thank God you. bless you, and thank you for coming. Thank you very much. All right, sir.